Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator some rehearsal, it requires some preparation to be able to have a smooth and swift response. Uh, part of that preparation involves making sure that we have emergency medications uh, organized in a way that they're readily accessible, readily available. This includes things like a, a rapid source of sugar for hypoglycemic emergencies, uh, a source of epinephrine to inject for anaphylactic reactions or severe bronchospasms uh, and, and knowing the doses and having them labeled, ideally with an EpiPen auto-injector, um, but certainly having uh, epinephrine vials that can be reconstituted and diluted is a slightly uh, more cost-effective option. Having a, you know, a, a source of oxygen that's checked on a at least on a monthly basis for adequate pressure and, uh, and a defibrillator as well. There's a variety of um, airway equipment as well that, that one should have readily available. Give me just a moment. Sorry about that. Um, and here's some uh, examples of uh, medical kits that are available. There's also uh, offices that so, some uh, offices carry nasal uh, Narcan, which is available for opioid overdose as well. So um, when it comes to airway management, there's a variety of oral and nasal airways that one can use and um, for, for a variety of airway emergencies. This re requires some degree of training to be able to use these properly and is particularly useful for moderate to, to deep IV sedation cases in patients that have uh, airway obstruction. So we'll go over a few uh, different types of emergencies. Uh, Chad is a, a, an 18-year-old healthy male that presents for uh, root canal treatment and uh, is kind of worried about the local anesthesia injection. And um, when the patient uh, is, is asking for the dentist to stop, the dentist notices that the patient seems nauseous and lightheaded. Um, the patient looks pale and his skin is clammy and, and, and sweaty, uh, and he seems to have a sluggish response. So um, when, when something changes about a patient's uh, mental status or about their, their response or the way they're feeling, a uh, typical approach is to first ask about their symptoms, but also at the same time, we want to call for help, and we want to obtain their vital signs. The pulse rate was 50 uh, per minute and a blood pressure of 90 over 60. Now, these vital signs are only relevant when compared to the baseline vital signs. So we should always have baseline vital signs before we treat a, a patient, at, ideally at the time of the initial consultation. Of course, 90 over 60 is normal for some patients, but it's certainly um, a little bit uh, hypotensive for most and 50 
uh, beats per minute may be okay for for a, a marathon runner or someone who is an elite athlete, but is would not be normal for most uh, adults. So differential, is this a local anesthesia reaction? Uh, is, in, is this an allergic reaction? Is this anxiety related? Is this an underlying medical condition? And as you can imagine, this is probably the most common type of reaction from a patient that's anxiety related. So typical symptoms of a vasovagal response is nausea, lightheadedness, dizziness, diaphoresis, uh, paler, and patients may occasionally have a sluggish response. They have some. They may have some altered mental status, and the reason for this is that there's a drop in the heart rate and a decrease in the blood pressure, which means decreased cerebral perfusion. Typically, these patients are uh, getting adequate oxygen. There's no lack of oxygen, and in this case, if you have a pulse oximeter, you can check that. And this patient had normal oxygen saturation uh, of 97% on room air. So I like to break down the emergencies into non-life-threatening and severe life-threatening um, emergencies. Non-life-threatening emergencies are anxiety-related or self-limiting, maybe treatment-related. Um, and in those cases, we still need to assess the patient and communicate with the patient to try to understand what their symptoms are. We need to obtain vital signs, uh, review the medical history to see if there's any con contribution from their medical history, and arrive at a diagnosis. And as we reassess the patient, if they go back to normal, uh, then you know we may continue the procedure and send the patient home. But if we feel that there's an there's a ongoing problem, we may refer the patient to a higher level of care, maybe to the emergency room. If we're dealing with a more severe or a life-threatening infection, something that's compromising the airway, breathing, or the circulation, uh, or something like a severe anaphylaxis, then we want to look at um, immediately calling for help and having uh, a system in place in the office to call 911 or whatever the number is for the uh, first responders and medical providers. And uh, in the meanwhile, treat the patient to the best of your ability with uh, vital signs, oxygen, et cetera, depending on what the condition is, and then transfer the patient to a higher level of care. So in this particular case, uh, the patient had a vasovagal syncope. This is mediated by a strong vagal tone that leads to bradycardia and hypotension. And um, this is relative to the patient's baseline vital signs. This is the most common office emergencies. The number one thing here is to reassure the patient and recline the chair so that get the, the head down and get the feet up. Uh, check the vital signs, get a kidney basin and if the patient's feeling nauseous. Trendelenburg position is basically head down and legs up. Uh, Dr. Frederick Trendelenburg was a, a German surgeon, I believe, if not an Austrian surgeon. And he uh, described a Trendelenburg position to uh, improve access for pelvic floor surgery um, and abdominal surgery to get the contents of the abdomen uh, up and off the, the pelvic floor. Cold compresses to the forehead and abdomen typically uh, help improve the discomfort. Uh, it's okay to give oxygen, but these patients technically don't need any additional oxygen. They just need some time. And we usually, usually recheck their vital signs, especially the blood pressure and the heart rate until they return to normal. If the patient continues to have bradycardia, like a low heart rate with um, symptomatic hypotension, then it's possible they may need an anti-muscarinic or anticholinergic agent like glycopyrrolate or even atropine. Probably atropine 0.5 milligrams would be a little bit of a big dose. That would be more for more severe um, bradycardia and hypotension. So pro probably a smaller dose potentially and even would go with a slightly less potent anticholinergic like uh, glycopyrrolate 0.2 milligrams. So the question is, can proceed or cancel the procedure? This depends on individual providers uh, level of comfort, but proceeding with the procedure is reasonable if the patient has had an allergic uh, or, uh, excuse me, an anxiety provoked reaction that has resolved. Scenario two is uh, 
a young lady who presents for a clinical crown lengthening. She's quite anxious about the procedure and received uh, oral sedative medications, two milligrams of Ativan, uh, one hour prior to the procedure for anxiety. She doesn't look sedated during the procedure, however, and after admi administration of local anesthesia, she starts breathing very rapidly and taking quick, shallow breaths. The dental provider tries to help her calm down and relax, but is noticing that she's moving her hands and legs like she's having a seizure. We have to keep in mind that with any kind of oral sedative medications, there is the potential that um, there's slower uh, enteric absorption, there may be delayed gastric emptying, and so oral, oral sedatives are typically difficult to titrate and the response can be unpredictable. The patient may become sedated later on, you know, throughout the procedure potentially. So you ask the patient, what is wrong? Are you okay? The patient replies that they're feeling really dizzy and don't feel good. Um, the patient is um, feeling lightheaded, but she's conscious. She is responding. She is very anxious. She's exchanging air, but she feels like she's having difficulty breathing. And she's feeling areas of paresthesia around her face. She feels like she might have some chest pain and she feels her heart racing hard and fast. She's having some palpitations and her skin is also getting clammy. She has a sense of impending doom. She seems very anxious. So what do we think this is? Is it a seizure because of the way she's moving her hands and her legs? Is this hypoglycemia, maybe an electrolyte imbalance causing some, you know, paresthesias in the perioral area? <clears throat> um, she also received local anesthesia. Is it related to that? It is anxiety. Is it anxiety related or some underlying medical condition? So again, we look at our, um, we look at our uh, decision tree here. And we have to decide what this is. And so we want to call our staff for help get vital signs and try to determine what's going on. Um, this patient is having a classic anxiety response uh, where she's hyperventilating. And so we want to get the patient to breathe more slowly and we want her to rebreathe her own carbon dioxide. Do we need oxygen to treat this? The answer is no. There's no lack of oxygen. There is a lack of carbon dioxide. So if you have a brown paper bag or, the, or you can use anything else. The patient can even put their hands over their nose and mouth and they can rebreathe their carbon dioxide. Check their vital signs, get a kidney basin, reassure them, get them to try to breathe nice and slow. So what happens is when we uh, hyperventilate, we're blowing off excessive amounts of carbon dioxide, which causes a respiratory alkalosis. And this respiratory alkalosis leads to an increased binding of free ionized calcium to albumin. And this leads to relative hypocalcemia, as well as flushing, tingling, and muscle spasticity. You remember that carbon dioxide uh, regulates cerebral blood flow, so a drop in carbon dioxide also results in decreased cerebral perfusion pressure. And so cerebral hypoperfusion will also cause some altered mental status. Um, and again, the hypocalcemia will lead to um, the you know, unusual and abnormal involuntary movements of the hands and feet, which is known as carpopedal spasms. So here's a, an example of a question, a multiple choice question. Your patient's suddenly hyperventilating, feeling dizzy and lightheaded. You notice carpopedal spasms, panic, she looks pale and diaphoretic. Which of the following actions should you take? A, give the patient oxygen. B, place the patient in a supine or chandelion group position. C, give them albuterol because they're breathing really fast and maybe having an asthma attack. Or D, ask the patient to breathe into a brown paper bag and slow down their breathing. So the answer would be D. Again, oxygen is not indicated. There's no lack of oxygen. Um, in terms of patient position, supine or Trendelenburg is appropriate for patients having a vasovagal reaction. For a patient who's hyperventilating, um, we would simply try to position the patient 
to comfort. So ask them what feels comfortable. If it's a semi-reclined position, that's fine. And uh, in order to determine if albuterol is indicated, this is typically in patients with a past medical history of uh, asthma, and you'd have to use a stethoscope and auscultate the lung fields to determine that there is uh, an expiratory wheeze. But again, um, this, this case was a hypoventilation, um, hyperventilation case. Okay, here's another question. Your patient is a diabetic who has sudden altered mental status, confusion, irritability, headaches, gait issues, fatigue, combativeness, restlessness, and diaphoresis. What is the most appropriate management? Do we check blood glucose and give insulin if there is a low blood glucose, if there's hypoglycemia? We probably wouldn't do that because insulin will drop the blood glucose blood uh, glucose level even further do we check the blood glucose level if hyperglycemia is present give honey or sub sublingually no because we, we don't need to treat hyperglycemia in a, in a dental office setting do we check the blood glucose level and if hypoglycemic administer one amp of d50 iv or sugary juice the answer would be yes the answer is c uh, anytime somebody has an altered mental status, we want to check uh, for uh, patient uh, alertness and, and if they're oriented to place, person, and time. Do they know who they are? Do they know where they are? Do they know what year it is, what day it is, what time it is? And are they moving all four extremities? Um, do they have symmetric facial expression on smiling? And are they able to talk in a way that uh, is comprehensible? If, if they're not moving all four extremities, if they, if, they, if they have a symmetry in their face or they're slurring their speech, that's when you have to worry about a stroke. So uh, this segues nicely into the next scenario of um, uh, a pharmacist who I was having coming in for a crown with a history of high elevated cholesterol levels. And you ask the patient a question, but she doesn't respond right away. You ask her again and notice a change in her voice and the words don't make sense. You ask her, what is your name? Where are you? Can you hold out your arms? Push, you know, if you, if you um, have them hold your, your fingers and ask them to squeeze your fingers to see if there's equal strength in the right and left uh, arm, put your hand under their, under their foot, under their uh, shoe or foot and have them push down like they're pushing down on the gas pedal of a car. You can look at their pupils with a, with a little flashlight, check their vital signs and blood glucose level with a glucometer, and uh, check their family history. If, they, if this is a sudden change and they have a facial asymmetry, a facial droop, or slurring their speech, or when they put their arms out, if, their arms, uh, if they have arm weakness on one side with their arm drifting down, then basically you have to call uh, the ambulance, call 911, or whatever the number is where you live. Because if we look at our decision tree, this is a potentially life-threatening and severe emergency. Um, and we would want to get the patient to the hospital as soon as possible. So about 87% of strokes are embolic. Uh, it means that there's an occlusion of one of the arteries. And about 13% are hemorrhagic. And the hemorrhagic ones tend to result from an aneurysm of one of the cerebral arteries or its branches. And that's why we, we don't treat patients with aspirin or with any kind of um, anticoagulants until we know for sure that it's not hemorrhagic. So when there is altered mental status like this, basically assume it's a stroke until you've proven otherwise. Um, and these patients may have sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding. They may have numbness or weakness of the face, arm and leg, trouble seeing in one or both eyes trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, severe headache with no known cause. Um, so know how to recognize this and uh, the acronym is FAST again. Um, with regards to treatment, when a patient goes to the hospital, they will likely have uh, an urgent CT scan and they may potentially be candidates for medications that can dissolve a blood clot. And uh, this is used in about 25% of patients with strokes. 
They may also be candidates for an endovascular procedure that may be performed by a neurosurgeon or a neurointerventional radiologist um, and, uh, or potentially a vascular surgeon, depending on where you live. In some cases, if there is bleeding from an aneurysm, platinum microcoils might be used to treat the aneurysm. So that's as far as strokes go. And here's another patient, 60 years of age, who presents uh, with uh, left jaw pain since this morning. She's been feeling unusually tired, uh, somewhat nauseated, and lightheaded as well. Now, when patients come in with jaw pain to a dental office, oral surgery office, obviously the first thing that we'll be thinking about is um, that they, this may be adonogenic in nature, this may be related to bruxism or TMJ problems. But we got to keep in mind that referred, um, referred pain to the jaw uh, can also be cardiogenic in some cases. And as with any pain, we want to ask about the onset. When did this start? What caused it? What's making it better or worse? How severe is the pain? Is it constant? Does it come and go? What's the quality of the pain, et cetera? Has the patient taken anything for it? Have they had this kind of pain in the past? Feeling unusually tired and feeling nauseated or lightheaded is also not typical of most common jaw pains or dental pains. So we got to keep in mind that there's a possibility of cardiogenic pain related to myocardial infarction. Um, typical symptoms of a myocardial infarct infarction include pressure or pain in your chest, like an elephant sitting on your chest, discomfort in one or both arms. The pain or discomfort can also be in the back, depending on the location of the occlusion, or in the stomach and the abdominal area. Uh, some patients report discomfort in the neck or jaw area, uh, or a feeling like they can't breathe well. Lightheadedness uh, or feeling like you're breaking out into a cold sweat has also been reported by some patients and feeling sick to your stomach like nausea. Interestingly though, women can experience a myocardial infarction without chest pressure. Uh, so can diabetics. Shortness of breath occasionally is what has been described by some women with an MI. The feeling like you ran a marathon but you haven't really made a move. A uh, feeling of pressure or pain in the lower chest or abdomen, dizziness, lightheadedness, and, or, or feeling faint, upper back pressure like squeezing or a rope being tied around the back and chest, and extreme fatigue in some cases. Some women even present with just a feeling of extreme fatigue um, and some shortness of breath. So when somebody has difficulty breathing, one of the first things on your differential should be that this potentially could be a myocardial infarction. Although certainly listening to their lungs with a stethoscope is also appropriate and eliciting a history of whether they've had shortness of breath before and if it's related to asthma, COPD, bronchitis, or something like that. We got to keep in mind that recognizing a myocardial infarction and um, getting the patient to the hospital as soon as possible is essential to survival and improving quality of life. Ideally, door to balloon time is 90 minutes uh, from the time the patients get to the hospital. And so the typical presentation is you have a middle-aged male, 56 years of age, with elevated cholesterol and dyslipidemia and hypertension. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as he's undergoing a procedure, he starts, uh, because of the increased stress, he starts complaining of chest pain, uh, you know, a heavy kind of crushing mid-sternal chest pain that may radiate to the left shoulder and arm or potentially to the neck. This may be associated with anxiety and pain and typically will cause some tachycardia initially. The patient will likely complain of some difficulty breathing. Um, if you obtain vital signs, you might find an increased respiratory rate, increased blood pressure, and you may find initially an increased um, heart rate. The patient may complain of feeling dizzy or faint as well. And uh, there are certainly a variety of differentials. There are many patients that come to emergency departments with chest pain who uh, undergo EKG and undergo serology testing for troponin levels, and then they're found to have non-cardiogenic pain. So several other things can cause chest pain, 
uh, chest wall pain can arise from costochondritis, uh, can arise from muscular pain, like muscle spasms. Bronchospasm can certainly cause trouble with breathing and chest pain, biliary spasms as well, gastric reflux, uh, pleuritic chest pain. And then obviously there's angina, which uh, is a prequel to potentially a, a, an MI, which may be stable angina that resolves with cessation of exertion or unstable ang angina, which uh, usually um, arises at rest without ex extra exertion. So the problem here is a mismatch between oxygen supply and oxygen demand because of narrowing or because of a complete occlusion of the coronary artery. Um, this is a life-threatening emergency, as you all know, so we would want to call for help ASAP and, and activate the emergency response systems. We'd want to get vital signs. We want to give patients that have chest pain difficulty breathing oxygen right away. And um, nitroglycerin is appropriate, but you want to make sure that they're not hypotensive. You want to make sure that they're seated because nitroglycerin will uh, drop the blood pressure and can cause patients to faint. Um, nitroglycerin also will only really help if the patient is having angina. It will likely not help in the setting of a myocardial infarction. Uh, aspirin, uh, usually a baby aspirin is given and can be uh, absorbed sublingually by having the patient chew on the uh, aspirin tablet and uh, keep it under their tongue. We want to auscultate the lung fields. Uh, in some cases, if you have advanced training, you might consider using short-acting beta blockers to reduce the work of the heart and, um, and get the patient to the hospital. Now, because patients have severe anxiety, it's been advocated to give them morphine or some kind of anxiolytic. If you have it, you can give them an anxiolytic uh, to reduce their pain or their anxiety. Um, and, and decrease the work of the heart, basically. Here's another scenario, and uh, if anyone has any questions um, about a scenario, you can uh, type them into the chat, and I can stop and, and address it. Um, so here's another scenario. John, a 25-year-old male for scaling and root planing, and uh, has a history of hypothyroidism and seasonal allergies. Uh, the hygienist greets him. Uh, the office is, uh, um, doesn't have any nitrile or vinyl gloves and only has uh, latex gloves. T two minutes after the beginning of the procedure, the patient is visibly uncomfortable and is itching his hands. Um, and uh, later on, he feels like his lips and throat feel swollen and it's getting harder to breathe. Um, the hygienist notices that the lips are swollen and there's large blotchy red papules over the arms, neck, chest, and the patient is itching his leg now. The patient uh, says, I'm having difficulty breathing and it feels like my throat is swollen. Um, so as many of you know, this, you know, is most likely an allergic reaction, a type one hypersensitivity and patients may have a swollen tongue, they may have swelling in their pharynx and swelling in their lips. This is obviously going to be associated with um, a fight or flight type uh, sympathomimetic response. So initially, we'll see tachycardia and hypertension. But as we continue to have third spacing and redistribution of plasma uh, out into the interstitial space, we will have a decreased amount of uh, volume, intravascular, and the patient may become hypotensive. Uh, the patients may have chest pain or difficulty breathing and wheezing as well. So this is an allergic reaction, a type one hypersensitivity. This is life-threatening because it could compromise the airway and the circulation. So we wanna call for help, call, 911 or activate emergency response, give oxygen. And, and, you know, this is again, a type one hypersensitivity that's IgE mediated. So there is um, degranulation of mast cells and basophils releasing histamines and many other cytokines. It's a distributive shock. So there's 
uh, an increase in blood vessel permeability and a fluid shift from the intravascular to the extracellular space. This shift of fluids to the extracellular space leads to edema, including in the larynx and can occlude the airway. So um, this is definitely life-threatening. Probably the most important two things that you can do as fast as possible in this situation is remove the allergen and administer epinephrine. And um, the, the EpiPen for adults is uh, 0.3 milligrams given intramuscular to the vastus lateralis muscle in the lateral thigh. And the pediatric EpiPen um, delivers a dose of 0 0.15 milligrams. If you have um, epinephrine in the office, um, you can administer 0.1 milligram to a child or 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine to an adult uh, in the right lateral thigh or left lateral thigh or intramuscular in the shoulder as well. Uh, if you have an IV or you want to give intramuscular Benadryl, this will help with the itching and the ongoing uh, pruritus and uh, swelling. You can also administer methylprednisolone or dexamethasone, any kind of corticosteroids will help. And you want to give these patients oxygen. Again, remove the allergen. If you're wearing latex gloves, if they're reacting to the latex gloves, get those uh, away from the patient, get them off of you um, so that uh, the reaction doesn't continue. And obviously you need to get this patient to the hospital uh, since an allergic reaction can recur, or it's possible in some cases, the allergic reaction may be to something that you've injected, uh, something, for instance, in the local anesthetic, uh, like a preservative uh, in, in a multi-dose uh, vial of local anesthesia. And so this may stay in their system and they need ongoing care and monitoring. These are the type of uh, EpiPen auto-injectors that we have and um, they come out of a, a casing. And then once you take the blue uh, top off, then you basically hold it tight in your hand and um, push it. And then there will, be, uh, there will be a compression of this orange tip and the, um, the needle will come into and through the skin into the muscle. And you hold it there for three seconds to allow the epinephrine to be delivered. So um, the, the epinephrine uh, acts on alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 adrenal receptors uh, to basically reverse vascular permeability, cause vasoconstriction to help restore the blood pressure and improve organ perfusion, decrease mucosal edema. Uh, it will tend to increase the heart rate and contractility of the heart, and uh, through beta-2 receptors, it will cause vasodilation um, and bronchodilation. So that's why it's also a treatment for severe bronchospasm in asthmatics. Benadryl will target H1 receptors uh, to relieve urticaria and itching. And steroids will help reduce extracellular swelling and edema as anti-inflammatory and stabilizes membranes. It'll help prevent recurrence and it'll tend to last for longer. Some uh, people uh, also advocate using H2 receptor antagonists, although um, I don't know if there's much evidence to support this. And in, in cases where there is a concomitant bronchospasm, albuterol uh, can also be used uh, through a nebulizer, meter, meter dose inhaler, or um, um, racemic epinephrine is also an option there. Oxygen is good. Um, if patient is developing advanced uh, airway edema and may have a loss of the airway, we may need to intubate the patient or perform a surgical cricothyrostomy or a tracheostomy. I think the take-home message is have an EpiPen in your office and know how to use it. Always obtain um, a thorough medical history, including allergies to any uh, latex products or any medications before treating patients, and ideally avoid any the use of any latex gloves. But keep in mind, for latex allergic patients, there may be other things in the office that have latex, um, like for instance, tubing for nitrous oxide gas, and sometimes even the plunger in um, the, kind of the typical local anesthesia carpule may have latex in it. Okay, I see two questions uh, in the chat. Uh, 
is there a correlation between hypothyroidism and type 1 allergic reactions? The answer is I'm not aware of one, but I don't know. I'd have to do a little literature search to see if there is. So the most common airway complication um, is a foreign body, air, upper airway obstruction, but certainly uh, anaphylactic reaction or angioedema can cause tongue, lip edema, pharyngeal edema. This can obstruct the airway. If you're performing a surgical procedure with an air turbine handpiece, you may be forcing air under the soft tissue. This may end up under the under the tongue, under the floor of the mouth, and uh, this air emphysema could be a source of, of uh, difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, and could potentially lead to an airway problem. Uh, lingual hematoma, if you're placing dental implants um, in the mandible, if you go through the lingual cortical plate, um, even anteriorly or laterally, you may hit a, a branch of the sublingual artery uh, or, or another type of blood vessel. And this can cause bleeding in the floor of the mouth that can obstruct the airway um, and, and cause uh, death. So certainly uh, we want to be aware of all these possible causes of airway obstruction. Uh, and if you're performing IV sedation, uh, you, may, you may be dealing with bronchospasm, especially in, patient, in uh, those practitioners dealing with um, deep sedations or general anesthesia in their office. Causes of lower airway obstruction are going to be bronchospasm, typically aspiration in a patient that has vomited or pulmonary edema. So um, because we work in the oral cavity and the patients are frequently supine, this increases the chance that small instruments like endodontic files can fall into the oropharynx. This can compromise the airway, especially in patients with, with compromised or reactive airways like geriatric and pediatric uh, population um, which may aspirate or have an obstruction. So the key is prevention. Use a rubber dam whenever possible to minimize the chance of uh, supplies and materials falling into the oropharynx. Use a gauze pack whenever possible when a patient can tolerate it. Attach floss or suture material with a long tail to items that can slip for easy retrieval. So here's an example of somebody who is undergoing a dental extraction and the tooth slipped out and you lo everybody looks and nobody knows where the tooth is and you take a lateral cephalogram and you can see the tooth is at the glottic opening just above the vocal cords. Um, so when, when there's a risk of impending airway obstruction, uh, first of all, determine if the patient is, if the patient's speaking, if they're coughing, they're moving air. Uh, tracheal tugging, uh, if you'll see kind of a retraction of the, of the trachea, if you look at the neck, is a sign that there's obstruction. And you, you, you know, the typical example is you at a restaurant, somebody uh, ch is choking on their food, and um, the food is stuck over their uh, vocal cords and the larynx, and they can't breathe. And they put their hands over their neck, and you can see as they're trying to breathe, there's this neck retraction of the trachea. And so those patients need a Heimlich maneuver. Um, so impending airway obstruction symptoms may include coughing, dyspnea, dysphagia, dysphonia, uh, strider, uh, increase like a high-pitched breathing sound or hoarseness in their voice. Um, in patients that have adonogenic infections that spread into the neck, you know you, you, you have a problem if the patient can't swallow their saliva. Those patients need not only an incision and drainage of the abscess, but they also need their airway to be secured and monitored closely. Um, so if you're able to see the foreign body, you can grasp it with uh, forceps, uh, like tongue grasping forceps or McGill forceps and remove it. You want to have uh, uh, a large suction available, like a Yankauer suction. Um, you may turn the patient's head to the side. You want to give them oxygen 100% as much as possible because if they have an airway obstruction, the more the patient is hyperoxygenated prior to the obstruction, the longer you have to, um, to relieve the airway obstruction um, and, and you'll maintain you know, oxygenation of the brain and heart for longer while, while you relieve the obstruction. So uh, the, the classic maneuver for an obstructed airway 
try to you know tilt the head and give a chin lift or perform a jaw thrust. This is especially applicable for patients who have airway obstruction because of sedation. Um, and then uh, you know pull the tongue forward if need be. You can put a nasal or an oral airway. But of course, if it's um, an actual foreign body that's obstructing the airway, uh, a Heimlich maneuver, ideally with the patient standing, but seated, uh, you can also perform a Heimlich maneuver. And this creates uh, an increased amount of abdominal pressure pushing up on the diaphragm to create, um, you know, an explosive uh, current of air that will hopefully dislodge the foreign body. In some cases, if you're not, if this doesn't work, you can try positive pressure ventilation with a face mask and uh, an ambu bag, and you can try to force air to push the foreign body further down into the trachea, and usually will go uh, into the uh, right lung uh, through the right uh, main stem bronchi, so, uh, and right main stem bronchus rather. Um, now, the reason this would be better if you can't get a Heimlich maneuver is because even if you force the foreign body further down into the um, the uh, bronchi, uh, this will this will need to be retreated later on, retrieved later on uh, with a bronchoscopy. However, you will break the obstruction and you will allow the patient to oxygenate and ventilate um, until that is done. Intubation is an option. You may, uh, if the patient loses consciousness, you can use a laryngoscope if you're trained for that and try to remove the foreign body and place an endotracheal tube. Um, there's also an LMA, which is a laryngeal mask airway, um, and it is a surgical airway option. Here's an example of a laryngoscope. This has a battery and a light that shines through there. Uh, these blades typically sit in the vellecula and push the tongue and jaw forward to allow the visualization of the airway. This is your typical endotracheal tube with a cuff. So what we do when we're performing a laryngoscopy, we're uh, protruding the tongue and the mandible forward, and we're looking down uh, to see the larynx and the vocal cords, and then we're placing our endotracheal tube into the trachea, then inflating the cuff and ventilating for the patient. So uh, in the case of a patient who's under deep sedation, laryngospasm is not unusual and is an involuntary spasm of the uh, laryngeal musculature that's caused by uh, stimulation of the superior laryngeal nerve. This could be caused by uh, pharyngeal or oral secretions, foreign bodies, um, you know, pa or, or uh, passing an endotracheal tube or removing an endotracheal tube rather during extubation can also cause a laryngospasm. Um, for patients who are under general anesthesia, the laryngospasm can be prevented by extubating the patient deeply awake while they're deeply asleep or fully awake, um, and then protecting the airway with a throat pack. Good suctioning during a, a, a sedation procedure can help prevent this as well. So typical treatment for laryngospasm, number one is recognition. Um, this is a reflexive adduction of the lateral cricoretinoid muscle that leads to partial or complete laryngospasm. Partial laryngospasm, there's usually stridor, a high-pitched uh, noise during um, inspiration or expiration. And uh, with complete laryngospasm, there's typically no air movement. So there's going to be no sounds, but you'll see the tracheal tugging and chest wall retraction. And this negative pressure of inspiration, a closed glottis, can cause something called flash, called flash pulmonary edema. So if you're, somebody's trying to breathe really, really hard against an occluded, uh, vo a, a, occluded glottis um, with, with occluded vocal cords, this will cause um, dilation uh, of the uh, pulmonary vasculature, the capillaries, uh, and uh, can cause some fluid in the alveoli, which is known as flash pulmonary edema. So when you recognize a hyperactive airway uh, under deep sedation, the first treatment is usually a chin lift, jaw thrust, and to deepen the anesthesia. If you're using a general anesthetic like Brevitol or Propofol, you can give additional anesthesia to deepen the anesthetic, and this will decrease the reactivity of the superior laryngeal nerve. 
You want to stop the procedure. You want to uh, put gauze to pack off surgical sites to avoid any bleeding into the airway. You want to suction, adjust the head, and this will typically resolve most cases. Uh, if the patient um, continues to desaturate and there's no end tidal CO2 and there's no signs of ventilation, then we want to start breathing for the patient. Positive pressure ventilation with a bag, um, valve mask, and 100% oxygen will typically break um, most laryngospasms. So you want to form a good seal over the mouth and nose. So the treatment, if, if a complete laryngospasm doesn't break, then the treatment would be uh, to administer IV succinylcholine, usually 20 to 40 milligrams. Um, and uh, this will paralyze the, uh, the patient's vocal cords and, and their body. You would give propofol or a general anesthetic as well. And then you have to breathe for the patient for, for a while because it takes 10 minutes for succinylcholine to wear off. Um, we can use airway adjuncts like oral and nasal airways, um, LMAs, endotracheal tube, nasal tube. Again, laryngospasm is not something that you would expect uh, in, an, in an awake patient that you're not sedating. You also would not expect to have this problem in a light conscious sedation. This is primarily something we see with general anesthesia and deep sedation. Um, so uh, one thing to keep in mind, especially in really like muscular patients, is that uh, if patients continue to have uh, low oxygen saturation, around 85%, for instance, after we've broken the laryngospasm, we have to consider the possibility of flash pulmonary edema, also known as non-obstructive, post-obstructive, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, or negative pressure pulmonary edema. And this is um, basically negative pressure that's generated by inspiratory muscles of the chest wall uh, against the closed glottis, decrease the pulmonary interstitial pressure, which combine with intravascular hydrostatic pressure to overcome the oncotic pressure and push fluid into the alveolar interstitium. You'll remember the oncotic pressure is the pressure in the uh, vasculature by proteins such as albumin uh, and alpha-1 glycoprotein that help keep uh, fluid intravascular. And um, when when the but the intravascular hydrostatic pressure wants to force fluid out of the blood vessels out of the capillaries so when when the pulmonary interstitial pressure is uh, decreased that allows fluid to um, go into the alveoli and so this is a potential complication of laryngospasm it needs it's treated with positive pressure ventilation with peep uh, positive and expiratory pressure. These patients may need to be intubated. Frequently, they need um, a diuretic such as Lasix or furosemide uh, to help get rid of the excess uh, fluid in their lungs. And uh, they may need mechanical ventilation for a while. And it's monitored with arterial blood gases and with chest x-rays. Uh, this is a difficult airway algorithm. Again, more applicable for those of you who have um, who perform deep sedations, general anesthesia, or even moderate sedation, and who have anesthesia training. Um, but there's, there's a variety of different options, including ventilation, use of oral nasal airways, um, you know, using a combi tube or an LMA, an endotracheal tube, and a surgical airway. LMA is quite helpful. It's easy to use. It requires minimal training. It goes into the mouth and the throat, and uh, it looks like a diaphragm. The tip of the LMA, uh, when inflated, sits in the esophagus, and air goes into the trachea. Of course, this won't help if the trachea is ob obstructed um, by a foreign body, but, and keep in mind that this also does not uh, protect the airway from any um, gastroesophageal reflux that may be coming up. So this is not considered completely secure. Uh, so when it comes to invasive airway access, uh, that's kind of your, your final go-to and, re and again, requires some additional training. Um,
I see some questions here in the chat. What emergency situation have you experienced? And uh, Dr. Solomon uh, of Faymoon uh, mentioned a right mandibular third molar that dislodged into the submandibular space during surgical extraction. Uh, another respondent mentioned hypotension after extraction. Um, and another respondent here, a patient had type 1 hypersensitivity reaction after administration of local anesthesia. Um, so th this is definitely possible. Uh, anything, you know, any ingredient within the local anesthetic, even the, uh, if, if the plunger of the local anesthesia carpule has latex, that could be a cause of a hypersensitivity reaction, although individuals, patients can be allergic to just about anything. So the type 1 hypersensitivity, obviously, the management that we discussed. Uh, with hypotension, um, you know, uh, there's multiple different causes. Uh, hypotension could be caused by an MI, it could be caused by a heart block, like a type 1, type 2, or type 3 heart block. Uh, hypotension could also be the result uh, simply of a vasovagal reaction and be self-limited. So it requires, um, you know, it could be an MI. It requires getting, getting um, good baseline vital signs, uh, a medical history, and looking at the entire clinical picture to come up with a diagnosis, obtain, you know, a full set of vital signs to see what, what's going on with their heart rate. And is this something new? You, patients can also have hypotension just from taking antihypertensive medications uh, and, and being dehydrated as well. So multiple possible, um, possible causes there. So bronchospasm is another possible emergency in a patient, especially in a patient with a history of asthma. Uh, with any patient that has a history of asthma, we want to get uh, a good idea of uh, whether or not uh, their asthma is well controlled, whether they've had frequent uh, trips to the emergency room uh, for asthma attacks, whether they've had to be intubated for an asthma attack, although that's not very common. Um, we want to know if there are any triggers, if there's anything that uh, can, can trigger an asthma attack in their case for some patients, upper respiratory tract infections, allergies, uh, cold weather, um, you know, certain medications for some patients. Um, a bronchospasm is a powerful constriction of bronchial smooth muscles and leads to mucosal edema uh, within the, the bronchial walls and inflammation. And typically is associated with increased mucus secretions, further narrowing the airway. Uh, this can lead to difficulty breathing or, or symptoms of dyspnea and desaturation um, and wheezing on exhalation. So we want to get our stethoscope and listen to the lung fields. If you have this in your office, if you have the training for it. And uh, remember, it's an obstructive phenomenon. So there's distal air trapping and compromised air exchange, which can lead to uh, elevated carbon dioxide levels, so hypercarbia and hypoxemia. The treatment is typically albuterol or Ventolin, usually your rescue inhaler through a meter dose inhaler. For prior to sedation, I typically have patients uh, who are asthmatic take uh, two puffs of albuterol prior to the procedure. You can also use nebulized albuterol in normal saline. You can use um, something known as racemic epinephrine or uh, corticosteroids can help uh, with this as well. And uh, epinephrine can be given for severe asthmatic reactions um, subcutaneously or intramuscularly. Most practitioners are uh, uh, most practitioners are not really ready for um, emergencies in the office, and the reason for that is because we rarely deal with them, and we we, we don't become proficient at things that we practice rarely. So, practice makes perfect. You got to rehearse your response to these emergencies with your staff. Be organized and have uh, a tackle box or a little kit. Uh, with emergency medications, maybe even protocols of, of how to handle different types of emergencies. Um, so uh, here's uh, another comment here from the chat. Will pushing the foreign body down not cause irritation and increase secretion within the lungs, which may worsen the patient conditions? Uh, so the answer is 
that um, ideally we don't want to force a foreign body into the trachea and into the right or left main stem bronchus. Uh, but if we have no choice, if uh, the foreign body cannot be dislodged and uh, is obstructing the airway at the vocal cords, it is preferable to be able to breathe and save the patient's life and have to later deal with removing the foreign body. Yes, it'll cause irritation. Yes, it'll cause increased secretions. But, um, you know, you'll save that patient's life and that foreign body will be removed with a bronchoscopy in, in the hospital. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of practicality. Certainly another way to bypass a foreign body that's stuck uh, in the glottis is to perform a cricrothyrotomy, a surgical airway or a surgical uh, tracheostomy, although cricothyrotomy with an incision um, at the cricothyroid membrane is going to be simpler and, and lower risk for most people. So hopefully that, that uh, explains the rationale. Uh, what are the emergencies to watch out for with, when ketamine is in use? So ketamine is uh, a general anesthetic and uh, ketamine has a sympathomimetic effect. So ketamine will typically cause an increase in norepinephrine uh, release. And by that mechanism will lead to hypertension and will lead to uh, tachycardia. And in some cases, it can also lead to emergent delirium. So typically, prior to administering ketamine, uh, I use a benzodiazepine such as midazolam or Versed. Uh, and I use small pretty small doses of ketamine. Ketamine will, is a bronchodilator, so it is safe for asthmatics, and it, is, uh, it does increase secretion. So if a patient has already a lot of salivary secretions, ketamine may not be a good idea, or may be used in combination with something like glycopyrrolate, which is an anti-muscarinic, anti which will decrease secretions. But uh, you can only use ketamine in a healthy patient. You don't want to treat somebody with coronary artery disease, uh, with ketamine or somebody who's on uh, blood pressure medication uh, because ketamine can cause hypertension. It will increase the, the stress uh, on the heart. Uh, and so anybody who's, who may be at risk for myocardial, cardiovascular disease is not a candidate for ketamine. It's also not, not advisable to use ketamine in setting of trauma or anybody with int increased intracranial pressure because, again, it will raise the pressure. So hopefully that answers the question. Now, there is no, uh, there's no reversal agent for ketamine. So if a patient develops emergence delirium uh, and they become delirious and combative potentially, the only way to, that I know to manage it effectively is to keep them asleep with a general anesthetic like propofol until the ketamine wears off. My preference is typically to administer low doses of ketamine, usually no more than 30 milligrams in a given patient. But it is a very... Um, a very useful anesthetic and a powerful analgesic as well. Uh, so the last case was a diabetic that basically um, has low blood glu glucose levels and um, you want to, with any altered mental status, again, assume it's a stroke and unless proven otherwise, if you know it's a diabetic, especially if they took their insulin, but they need breakfast, they're likely hypoglycemic. So you get, use a glucometer in your office. Ideally, you should have a glucometer. Check the blood glucose before the procedure so you can administer um, a, a, a source of uh, fast-acting um, glucose for the patient, whether it's uh, you know sugar, sugary juice uh, or, or something else or, or D50 um ampule and so but again with altered mental status you want to look for signs of a stroke look for facial expressions movement of extremities alert and oriented to to all to place person and time uh, consider the possibility that altered mental status could be uh, a, a cause of uh, drug use like alcoholism uh, or heroin use you may look at the pupils for pupillary constriction um, with a little pen light and check uh, the blood glucose with the glucometer. Anything below 50 milligrams per deciliter indicates hypoglycemia. There's many possible symptoms here, um, but you need a, a source of ra uh, you know, um, rapid-acting uh, glucose, ideally. Uh, remember that uh, with hypoglycemia, uh, 
there's uh, what's called neuroglycopenia. So you, your brain is starved of glucose. This can also trigger the sympathetic response system and cause these symptoms, pale, shaking, sweating. Um, pa these patients may also have autonomic neuropathy and they, they can also have chest pain without pain. So any rapid source of glucose like sugar, sugary juice is okay. Sublingual honey can be administered. Um, a, a D, one amp of D50 um it has 25 milligrams of glucose can be administered um uh, and uh, glucagon can also be given but is, is less common then recheck the blood glucose obviously so in, in conclusion the appropriate response to an emergency requires recognition and rapid diagnosis record the time of symptoms onset um this helps uh when the ambulance arrives uh, with regards to knowing what treatments they can have. Have a system in place to recruit help so that your staff and assistants know exactly what to do when this happens and a system in place to call uh, the ambulance for help for any you know, more severe emergencies. Know where the emergency equipment is, oxygen, emergency kit. Have it organized and ready to go. Usually when an emergency is happening, this is not the time to try to figure out the doses or where the medication is because uh, you have to act fairly quickly. Know the correct treatment, but uh, obviously try to do no harm. And um, most importantly, be, you know, uh, train yourself to be vigilant and for your staff to know how to manage these different emergencies and what the doses are so they can be really kind of a team and, and working with you together. There's many other resources, um, and it's helpful to be to maintain your certification and basic life support and advanced cardiac life support, ideally. Um, so that's it. It's a nice quote for from Mahatma Gandhi. Any questions I can answer? All right. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Aronovich, for that very, very practical uh, session. So uh, I, I, want, I have a couple of questions here. So um, when, uh, when you place your implants, what, how do, you, do you use just a regular um, local anesthetic or you have to sedate your patient? Um, Most patients are going dental implants. Um, I typically use local anesthesia. Although uh, it, it comes down to patient preference. There's certainly some patients that have had uh, negative experiences uh, on, you know, undergoing any kind of surgical procedures. And so some patients request IV sedation. So uh, case by case basis. Okay. Okay. I see. Uh, what if, because uh, most of the time, okay, most, of the, most of the things that you're, um, that could serve as that I could potentially be an emergency. Uh, if if your patient is you're placing an implant, I usually you the patient doesn't communicate with you. So how do you keep? Uh, how do you make sure that the patient is is okay? Because I've heard of some second of the, the you know, in, a, in an institution where placing the implants and the patient already had a stroke and nobody knew and they were, they were still drilling. Um, in the setting of a sedated patient. I, 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 or, or an awake patient. An awake patient. Okay, so, so the question is, maybe can you, can you uh, repeat the question? I want to make so sure. The patient, so it's a scenario, I don't know what happened, but I know that the patient had a stroke while implants were being placed. Um, but, you know, in that state, the mouth was open. It was a full arch case, and they were going on, uh, you know, occasional, um, are you okay, you know, you know, at that point, you know, the patient is all draped up, couldn't really speak, but something had gone wrong, you know. So, so how, do you, how do you prevent that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, a stroke can happen anywhere at any time. Um, and, you know, during any dental procedure as well. So I think, like, frequently checking in with the patients is, is a typical practice, I think, for most dental practitioners is to, while they're doing the procedure, you know, to check in with the patient, say, hey, are you doing okay? Um, and just make sure that the patient's responding appropriately uh, 
um, that, that their posture is normal. Certainly, I, I can see how something like that could happen. You're, you're busy doing the procedure um, <laughs> and, and you're focused on, you know, executing the implant placement, which is very important. Um, and, 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 and if the patient doesn't, you know, doesn't say anything, doesn't change their demeanor, uh, or, you know, doesn't have any, any perceived issues, certainly a stroke can go unnoticed. Um, but I think that just frequent check-ins, looking at the patient, making sure their, you know, their eyes are open or that their, if their eyes are closed, check in with them, say, are you doing okay? Have them, you know, lift their arm up, you know, maybe both arms up and have them, you know, give you a thumbs up. So, you know, they're, they're able to move both arms, things like that. It's just frequent check-ins with the patient, making sure that they're, um, that they're doing okay. It's usually kind of what I think most people do. Um, but you're right. Yeah. Something like that. If the patient doesn't say anything and if you don't ask them, uh, you, you might find out at the end of the procedure and that's unfortunate. Yes. Yes. Anyway, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, if you have any other questions, please uh, do indicate or you send it as an email. We'll send it across. We do have another session coming uh, next week, uh, Tuesday uh, on, on grafting. So Dr. Ronovich, can you give us a little, uh, you know, uh, expose in terms of uh, what are we, what, what is the uh, presentation for next week going to look like in terms of the content? For next week, it'll be, I think, similar time at noon um, next Tuesday. And I'll, I'll discuss my experience with bone grafting and, uh, you know, what I currently use uh, and how I, you know, w what I choose for different types of scenarios. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I think there's one last, I don't know if it's a question. Uh, doctor, yeah. Can you see the question? Uh, uh, how do you maintain airway when using ketamine and working intraorally at the same time? Um, so, you know, again, if you're going to use ketamine, you need to have advanced training either as an oral surgeon or, or as a dental anesthesiologist, um, you know, and you need to have advanced airway training by, you know, by an anesthesiologist. So I would not recommend trying to use uh, any kind of, sedatives without having adequate anesthesia and airway training. Uh, but when we perform deep sedations, that's usually the setting in which we use ketamine. And um, typically, patients have all monitors on board. So we use uh, capnography, we use pulse oximetry, EKG, blood pressure cuff, we, we're measuring, you know, respiratory rate and heart rate and blood pressure and, 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 and tidal CO2. And, um, and we're also maintaining the airway patent with a chin lift or jaw thrust, you know, during the procedure. Typically, we have anesthesia certified dental assistants that maintain the airway. Usually, there's a bite block in place uh, to keep the mouth open. And we usually use throat packs and uh, retractors that kind of create a seal between, um, you know, uh, at, at the tonsillar pillar to keep fluid and keep foreign bodies from falling back into the airway. All right. Okay. Let's see. I think there's one more. No, and, and, and I, I do not typically intubate during deep sedations, although throughout the U S and I'm sure throughout the world, there are many different, um, you know, levels of practice that people are comfortable with. I know there are some oral and maxillofacial surgeons in the U.S. who routinely intubate every single one of their patients, um, but I, I don't see the need for that personally. Um, and, and generally doing a deep sedation, realize the deep sedation, the, the value is uh, for the patient not to feel the injections. And typically, after we've injected local anesthesia, uh, we let the sedation wear off slowly uh, as we're doing the procedure and the patient's kind of slowly waking up. So uh, I usually don't keep the patients asleep for a very long time. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ronovich. I know you did mention that you do, um, you, you, are, you do uh, participate in outreaches to different parts of the world. Yeah, uh, I do. I've, I, I, uh, so I, I did a fellowship in cleft craniofacial surgery and um, one of the things I love doing is uh, cleft lip and palate repair surgery. So um, I, I've been to China and India 
uh, doing this kind of work. And I've been going to Mexico for the last, uh, well, since 2012. So for the last nine, eight, nine years, oh, wow. um, doing, you know, cleft lip and palate surgery for, for children in areas where there's no access to care. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Thank you. But I, I want to ask you, would you be, would you be willing to go to, uh, 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 some part of West Africa or, or, or the Middle East to do some dental implant, uh, um, you know, uh, training for, for the doctors who are uh, on this call? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, I would for dental implant training specifically just because placing dental implants is part of my practice. But I think there are more qualified people when it comes to teaching mm -hmm. that type of a thing, people who limit their practice to dental implants um who do dental you know hundreds of implants every year and that, that's not my practice but if when it comes to teaching cleft lip and palate surgery and things like that i, I would be willing to go anywhere all right guys you are listening if you guys can organize i mean we have patients all over the place all over the world who are willing, you know who are still not yet in the list for to be treated by Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 